Hi, I'm Gino, and music is a big part of my life. You can find me performing on stage with National Philharmonic at Strathmore, and right here in Sound Impact's Time Travel Goes Digital series. So join me as we travel up, up, and away! In a distant land, far into the future, with no music, who will unlock the sounds of the past? I repeat, Do not fear. Not Sound no. Impact is here. Sound Impact musicians stand united on board their time travel machine, venturing around the world through time, discovering musical treasures. Time to travel. Are you ready for a new adventure? Today our mission is to learn the language of music through an exploration of building sound. Who made this cello? Who wrote the music on the page? They are called composers. Composers are just like authors, but instead of writing stories or poetry, they write the music on the page for musicians like myself to play. Are you ready to meet the first composer? Time to travel! Up, up, and away! piece by a German composer, George Philipp Telemann. Telemann was a composer during the Baroque period. Classical music that was composed between 1600 and 1750 is called Baroque music. In classical music, as music was composed through these different time periods, the sounds were similar, but they really evolved over time. So in Baroque music, you hear a slightly different style than you'll hear in classical music. And then we get to contemporary music, which has a really radical style different than what we heard in Baroque music. Outside of classical music, we hear things like jazz and folk music and pop music. And we even hear music in movies. Have you seen Frozen 2? You know that really famous song that Adina Menzel sings called Into the Unknown? Well, that was written by a composer too. Do you know who that composer was? Well, that's actually a trick question because it was two composers. It was a husband and wife team, Kristen Anderson Lopez and Robert Lopez. Next time you watch a movie, listen closely and enjoy the music. And then I encourage you to go look up who the composer was and learn about their music and their lives. In episode one, you learned many things, including solo music and chamber music. Remember the first piece we played? That's an example of chamber music written by Telemann. Chamber music is when a small group of instruments play together. So in the first piece, you heard instruments like violin, viola, cello and the recorder. Throughout the 10 episodes, you'll learn about different composers like Saint-Saëns, Seriajo, Coleman, Meyer, Dvorak, just to name a few. Can you think of a composer on top of your head? Let's now go and meet the grandfather of all composers. Time to travel! Up, up, and away! <laughs>
he'll make more sense in a bit. Let's meet Johann Sebastian Bach. Like Telemann, he was another composer from the Baroque period. He came from a family full of musicians, and before a composer, he was church organist and also conducted choirs and orchestras. A cool fact, during Bach's time, the average height of person was much shorter than it is now. Well, a scientist discovered a photo of Bach's skeleton and discovered that he towered above the average man at 5 foot 11 inches. And you can imagine, with larger hands, you can reach more keys on the organ. And he had 20 kids! In 1708, Bach started writing his own compositions. When a composer writes music, it's called a composition. He hand wrote every note. Check out this music by Bach. It's a little difficult to read. I need a magnifying glass to see all of these little notes. Check out what it looks like today. Bach wrote thousands of pieces of music during his life. Can you imagine how tired his hand got from writing all of those notes? Bach wrote in a special style named counterpoint that was popular in the Baroque period. You ask, what is counterpoint? Well, let's go ask Dr. Counterpoint. Huh? Oh! <laughs> What's up? Did somebody call Dr. Counterpoint? I'm Dr. Counterpoint. Oh, you want to learn about counterpoint, huh? Well, you came to the right person. Counterpoint is a composition technique where instead of having a harmony with a melody, instead you have two or more melodies that are being played against one another. Fine that's for ladies, cheap was brave and new, good penny worth, but the body cannot move. Fine that's for ladies, cheap choice brave and new, good penny worth, but money cannot move. Counterpoint was especially popular in Baroque music. Huh. Here's an example of a Bach chorale using the style of counterpoint. How beautiful. Bach's music is so good that classical composers study his music for hours trying to learn from one of the best. Besides composers, another group that's very important to musicians are those that build our instruments. They handcraft every piece so it, you can imagine the years of study. My instrument was made by a German named Geipel over a hundred years ago. Can you imagine how many people have played my instrument? Remember at the beginning of the video I asked who built my cello? My cello was built in Italy by an Italian maker, Oreste Martini, and my cello is 85 years old. Remember the first piece be played by Telemann? Let's meet the creation of one of those instruments. Up, up, and away! We've now landed in Europe in the year 1598 in a region called Flanders. This here looks kind of like a strange and colorful piano, right? Well, this instrument was widely popular during the Baroque period. It's actually called the harpsichord, and it's similar to the piano because it's played with a keyboard, but it both sounds and works very differently. 
The harpsichord has no pedals to play with the feet. It has fewer notes on the keyboard to play. Overall, it sounds quieter. The keys are thinner and closer together, so your fingers are closer together too. And the color of the keys is usually opposite from what the piano is. This is white on black, and the piano is black on white. Now, unlike the piano, which makes sound by striking the strings with a hammer, harpsichord strings are plucked with what's called a plectra. The plectra is attached to the jack, which rests on the top of the back of the key and moves up to pluck the string when you push the key down, just like a seesaw. Most harpsichords also have more than one group of strings, which are called a choir. Each choir, or group of strings, has a different sound and can be turned on or off to mix different sounds together. This is done with what's called a stop lever, which works by shifting the plectra away from the strings so that they stop playing. Another tonal feature is the lute stop, which makes one choir sound similar to another instrument that was very popular during this time, the lute. Whether you press hard or soft on the harpsichord keys, the notes always sound at the same volume. So in order to play expressively, you can either play fewer or more notes at the same time, play shorter or longer, or use choirs together. J.S. Bach wrote many pieces for solo harpsichord, but let me introduce you to another composer who also composed harpsichord music, Charles Ignatius Sancho. Ready to meet him? Time to travel! Up, up, and away! We've landed in London in the year 1745 to meet the British composer, writer, and actor Charles Ignatius Sancho. Charles Ignatius Sancho was born around 1729 and gained fame in his time because he was the symbol of the humanity of Africans. He was one of the earliest people to write about African slavery in the English language. Now I'll play you one of his harpsichord compositions. Now it's time to depart the Baroque period. Let's go to present day for a special treat. Time to travel. Up, up, up and away. away. We've now landed in the year 2012 in San Diego, California, United States. This is a harpsichord that I built with my dad over the summer break from college. I was studying harpsichord in school, but I didn't have one to play at home. Since I love building things from wood, I thought I would try making one myself. Many of the special parts like the keyboard came from a build your own harpsichord kit that was originally made and sold in 1965, but was never opened until 47 years later. Modern harpsichords like this one sometimes are a little similar to the modern piano. They might have pedals, Oftentimes they have lower and higher notes and a louder sound. And this one here has keys that are black on white, just like a piano. Harpsichords are all very unique instruments. Besides working on and playing instruments, I'm also an audio engineer. That's someone who helps to make recordings of music. 
Now, it's only been about a hundred years since we started to listen to music recordings. In the past, music could only be heard when musicians were playing instruments right in front of you. But here in 2012, we have all kinds of new ways of assembling music. For example, even though I can only play one instrument at a time, with music recording and audio engineering, I can play music with myself at different times and then put all of that into one recording. Cool? Next up, let's meet another multi-talented builder of sound, a living composer and performer. Time to travel! Up, up, and away! And here we have our living composer, my good friend John Wineglass. Thanks so much for being a part of our Building Sound episode. It is a pleasure to be here with you, Rebecca. Okay, so first question I just want to ask, kind of, you are not only a composer, you're also a performer. Can you just tell us a little bit about your background? So I started performing when I was about five years old. Um, I picked up by ear um, the Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. I used to listen to my sister play piano, and I sat down at the piano and started kind of working those notes out on my own. And my mother came downstairs and said, I think we should get you music lessons. So I ended up with music lessons in the orchestra, actually. Um, went through several instruments <clears throat> and uh, landed on the viola. Um, and from there, I started to tour and see the world through music. Now, when you build sound through viola playing, keyboard playing, piano playing, composing? Is there one that speaks to you mo most? Well, I, you know, the thing is, when we talk about building sound, because I was in the viola section, and I was usually fourth chair, so I was right in front of the oboes. And so um, a lot of times sitting in orchestras, and it's the reason why I still play as a musician today, there's nothing like being on stage with a, with a live orchestra. Uh, from a kid, from age five, I had that experience. To hear that sound, um, I think of the orchestra as one instrument, as in like, like you would think of an organ. Um, the, the orchestra, I don't think of it as different sections. They're all one thing. And it just depends on what colors you plan to paint with that day as far as what instruments you use for certain things. Let's speak to that, the hearing and the colors. As a kid, five or six years old, I associated colors with music. And so the key of C was white. The key of F was orange. And then the key of G was kind of like a purple. So you not only build sound, you also paint pictures. Isn't meeting people through music such a fun adventure? We've reached the end of this episode, and I hope you learned a lot. I'll see you next time. Bye! Thanks for joining us today on our time travel adventure. You have learned many things, but there is still a lot of music we must uncover from the past. Until we meet again, your mission is to find out who composed your favorite song or piece of music, and learn something about their lives. Join us for our next time travel adventure when we learn about music and animals. Up, up, and away! Hello, I'm Peter Gajewski, music director and conductor of the National Philharmonic. I hope that you enjoyed Sound Impact's time travel adventure and will continue to join NatPhil as we explore music around the globe. This past spring, as the pandemic kept National Philharmonic's musicians from coming together as an orchestra, they filmed themselves performing solo pieces offering what cellist Yo-Yo Ma called songs of comfort. Please enjoy these performances that we call musical notes as we all look forward to a time when we can gather again and make music together.
These days, my family's at home for all of my practicing, including my almost two-year-old son, Logan, who's one of my toughest critics. Uh, he gets pretty tired of all the usual scales, arpeggios, and long tones, and much prefers a beautiful melody. So here's one of our favorites. This is Gershwin's Someone to Watch Over Me. 